I'd just turned 20 when I finally moved into my own place. For almost a year, I didn't do anything but just work and sleep, and my 21st birthday nearly passed without me even realizing it. Fortunately, a friend sent me a text asking what I had planned, and, and we decided to spend that evening at our favorite club. And that night, we just drank and played pool. A few guys tried to get us back to their place, but I did the smart thing and just went home. When my friend dropped me off, I was in a pretty bad state. I had already barfed once on the way, and I was fighting like crazy not to do it again. I made it about 20 feet before I felt another puke pushing up through my throat, and my neighbor just so happened to be outside smoking and rushed over to help me. He held my hair back as I retched repeatedly for the next few minutes. He walked me to my door and helped me in when I was finished. I passed out in my living room for the next nine hours. It's not quite the way a girl dreams of meeting her husband, but it was how I met mine. I had just gotten out of the shower when there was a knock at the door. I peeked out the peephole and was my neighbor. I was too embarrassed to face him, but I didn't want to be rude. I yelled out for him to wait a moment and quickly threw on some clothes. When I opened the door, I was kind of surprised. In my drunken state, I hadn't noticed how cute he actually was, and this just made me more self-conscious, and I couldn't even look him in the face. He asked if I was okay, and I said yes. There was a brief moment of uncomfortable silence before he introduced himself as Tyler. I said, nice to meet you, and slammed the door behind me. I was being rude, and I knew it, but it was still too soon to really face him. And a few days would pass before I got the courage to knock on his door. I apologized for my behavior and thanked him for his help. He smiled, and my heart melted, and... I'd just feel like I'd fallen in love in that moment. Our relationship moved relatively fast from there. When I wasn't at work and Tyler wasn't at school, we were together. We spent most of our time at his place, and it was much nicer than mine. He comes from a very wealthy family, so all of his stuff was very nice, and that isn't what drew him to me. He's actually a very kind and down-to-earth man, but I'd be lying if I said that I didn't enjoy lounging in leather chairs and sleeping in ultra-soft cotton sheets, I enjoy being pampered just as much as the next woman. What can I say? Tyler has given me all the attention I needed, but there was one reason that I'd sometimes get jealous early on. Tyler's car. He loved that thing almost as much as life itself. I don't know anything about automobiles, but I remember it was made by BMW and had an M on the back. And don't get me wrong, it was a very nice car, but sometimes I thought that he cared more about it than me. Despite my feelings about it, I was happy to see it go the way it did. This was in 2017. We'd been together nine months when it happened. We spent the evening at his apartment watching movies, and the two of us were curled up together on the couch and the windows were cracked, letting in the cool night air. Just after 8pm, there was a knock at the door. Tyler got up to answer it and I went into the kitchen to get some more wine. I'd just finished up filling my glass when I heard Tyler call me into the living room, and I still remember the hint of fear in his voice. When I turned the corner, I saw two guys with masks over their face, holding him at gunpoint. One of the men waved me over and told me to give him my phone, and I did as I was told. I almost dropped it because it was shaking so bad, and Tyler did the same. Then they demanded his wallet. He gave that over too without any resistance, and I started to speak, and one of the men whispered to me to shut up, and I did. They didn't ask for my money, I'm not sure why. I thought they had what they wanted and were going to leave, but then they demanded the key to the car. The pain on Tyler's face was very clear. He tried to bargain with the thieves, but they had obviously come there with one purpose. No amount of begging and pleading was going to stop them. His stalling was starting to annoy them, and the taller of the pair warned him to not play any games. He reluctantly gave in and walked over to the table where his keys were. He picked them up and walked back over to where we stood. At the last moment he drew his hand back. The tall man let out a sort of huff and knocked Tyler across the head with his gun. I screamed and the other guy barked at me to be quiet. I could only stand and watch as Tyler started to pour blood from his head and the tall guy quickly said, I warned you, give me the keys now. And Tyler slowly raised his hand as high enough for the shorter guy to snatch them, and now that they had got what they'd come for, 
They quietly slipped out the door without a word. The second the door closed, I ran to the bathroom, grabbing a towel. Tyler was just lying on the floor, moaning. I placed the towel on his head, and I asked him to just hold it there while I ran to call 911. At that time, I still had a landline, and I ran across the hall to call for help. Once I was sure an ambulance was coming, I hung up and ran back to be with Tyler. The ambulance arrived within a few minutes and rushed him off to the hospital. Fortunately, he was still awake when he left. I stayed behind to answer questions and then the cops gave me a ride to the hospital. I waited while they took Tyler for some tests to check for brain swelling and the like, and everything would come back clear, thank God. The doctors kept him overnight for observation and I stuck around to keep him entertained. We got an Uber back to the apartment later that next day and I could tell something was just different about him. As we passed the spot where his car was once parked, he stopped and stared for a good minute. He turned and looked at me and said, What was I thinking? I could have died. All because of a stupid car. Tyler's parents did offer him to buy him a new BMW, but he chose a far less flashy model instead. The robbery had made him scared to own anything like that ever again, and he even stopped wearing his gold Rolex that his mom had bought him for his birthday. And now that he knew people were willing to hurt him or maybe kill him for things like that, they just lost their charm. We decided that it was best to try and put the robbery behind us and move on. Even these days, when we're both successful and can afford almost anything, we live a very humble existence. That robbery taught us both something very important. You can have all the money in the world, all the fancy cars and jewelry, but nothing is worth losing your life over. Now before I share the incident that led to my incarceration, I should probably talk about how I found myself in a position to make such a foolish decision in the first place. I really had an ideal upbringing. My parents are still married and love each other as much as they love me, and both had well-paying jobs and we never went without. I was an only child which might have made me spoiled, but I wasn't allowed to get away with misbehavior or anything like that and our house was in a safe area of town filled with other happy families just like ours. I never lacked friends or opportunities to be around well-behaved, respectable kids. Even as I entered high school, there were no signs that I was about to take a wrong turn. Essentially, I had all the advantages a kid could dream of, yet I still ended up on a very destructive path, and it just goes to show that some of us are capable of ruining our lives on our own, and that's my story for sure. The problem started during my freshman year. There was nothing about the stoners that drew me towards them. I loved their music, clothing, and attitude. Everything about their lifestyle appealed to me. I spent time with them whenever possible, and they seemed to accept me from the very beginning. And before long, I was well on my way to becoming just like them. By the end of the first year, I was habitually smoking cigarettes and using pot on the weekends. I was undergoing a gradual transformation. Although I still maintained the kind, well-mannered demeanor that I'd been raised with, there was a growing restlessness beneath that polished exterior. I was tired of being nice to everyone at the expense of my own feelings. It was a no-more-Mr.-Nice-Guy kind of situation, you know? I wouldn't turn the other cheek anymore. If my parents noticed any changes in me, they didn't mention it. In their eyes, I must have still been their little boy. Even if they had said something, it likely wouldn't have made a difference and it was a path every young person really must navigate on their own, but I took a wrong turn somewhere along the way. And throughout the remainder of school, my attitude and grades took a significant downturn. By now, I was too intoxicated to focus on classes, and there were times that I really didn't even bother attending. Most of the time, we'd meet up outside of school and find a place to pass the time, away from prying adults and other kids. I could recount all the adventures that we had and the crazy things I witnessed, but that would take all day. And suffice to say, before my junior year, I had already repeated a year and was just a month away from dropping out completely. Despite my parents begging and pleading, there was nothing they could do to stop me. As much as I loved them, they held no power over me anymore, and their little boy was descending very deep. And unless they were prepared to chain me to some radiator, I was going to do whatever I wanted. Once I reached legal adulthood, that's when the real problems began. 
I moved into a rundown apartment with three or four other individuals who were also sort of on that downward spiral. People came and went at all hours of the day and night, and to be honest, I'm not sure whose name was on the lease. Somehow, I managed to stay sober long enough to obtain my GED and find a job washing dishes. The restaurant was sort of like a pharmacy. If you wanted it, someone could get it for you. One night, while partying with some of my coworkers, I made the unfortunate decision to try heroin. And that turned out to be the biggest mistake of my life. And in no time, I was addicted. I was spending entire paychecks on drugs and didn't care. The days that I went without, it was just a living nightmare, and I soon became desperate enough to sell my car. That made working much harder, but it didn't matter as long as I could score. Junkies don't tend to think about the long term, and when the aches and pains start, you're only concerned with the here and now. I left the place that I was living in and moved into an even worse situation with a group of other addicts. I wasn't there for very long, when one of my fellow addicts approached me with a plan to make a lot of money. He insisted that it would be easy, and according to him, we'd go in the middle of the day when no one was home, and we'd be out in no time. I was reluctant, but I was also broke, and my high was wearing off. He kept pressuring me until I reluctantly just agreed. I wanted to get it over with as quickly as possible. He and I walked about a mile to the house and went back around the back. He said there was an open window there and sure enough, he was right. We raised it and quietly slipped inside. I closed it behind me as he waited and he whispered for me to follow him into the back bedroom where the money was kept. We hurried into the bedroom and he went straight for the nightstand where he found a small money box and it was full of cash. After recounting it, we had about $300. It was far from the thousands that he had promised, but I didn't care in the moment. Not that we had the money, I just wanted to leave as soon as possible. However, he had other ideas. He started talking about stealing laptops and TVs. I told him it was a foolish idea. We were standing there arguing when a teenage girl walked into the room and panicked. As soon as she saw us, she bolted. The guy I was with chased after her and I followed him, asking what he was doing. The girl managed to make it to the bathroom and locked herself in. By this point, I was panicking too. I shouted at the guy that we needed to get out of there, but he was still trying to break into the bathroom. When the girl yelled out that she was calling the cops, I had had enough. I turned around and ran out the front door. When I returned to our place, I hid in the closet and just waited for the police. I must have fallen asleep for a few hours, and I was awakened by a man's voice yelling, Police, come out and I knew there and then it was all over. I slowly opened the closet door, came out with my hands up, and an officer placed me in handcuffs before taking me to the car. And that'd be the last time that I'd be free for almost a year. As I expected, that idiot got me arrested and just gave me up. It turned out that he knew the residents of the house. He had dated that girl's older sister a few years prior, and he knew that she could identify him. I have no idea what he planned to do to her, and I don't want to know. I ended up spending the next 11 months in that county jail, where I experienced the worst withdrawal of my entire life. I would never wish that kind of misery on anyone. However, it had one positive aspect. It was so terrible that I never wanted to go through it again, and I've been clean ever since. December 12th of this year will mark my fifth anniversary of sobriety. I don't know if there's any moral to my story other than I don't encourage anyone to go down the path that I have. The problems that come with addiction outweigh any possible benefits that you may be able to come up with. And since I've gotten out, I've been able to renew my relationship with my parents and I've got a fiancé now. And I can't think of a better way to end the story. That's all. Stay safe, kids. It was the Christmas holiday of 2015. My grandparents on my dad's side were flying in to celebrate with us. I joined my folks for the drive to the airport. The whole way there I fantasized about what I'd get come Christmas morning. Toys no longer interested me. I had been promised a mountain bike for my birthday but it never arrived. Maybe this coming holiday was my chance. A laptop or console was an option too. I was 14 that year and things in my life were starting to change. 
I wasn't sure about anything anymore, to be honest. Most of my friends no longer had time for me and I was starting to feel unwanted. The only times I felt normal was when I was out in nature or locked in my room playing games. Even then I knew it wasn't healthy for me, but what was I going to do? I wanted to talk to my parents about it, but I didn't think they'd understand. Their time in school had been completely different. Both were involved in sports and popular with their peers. My experience was the exact opposite. How is the prom king going to understand what it's like for a nobody, I would think to myself. My grandparents were already waiting at the curb when we arrived. Dad and I helped load their bags into the car. I was looking for any odd-shaped or strange objects, but nothing stood out. The ride home was much like the ride there. I was lost in my thoughts most of the time, only occasionally being interrupted by a question from one of my grandparents. The endless miles of open fields were a welcome change. I'd rack my brain attempting to identify the birds that flew past and the trees that lined the fence lines. These were the few things in life that never changed, or so I thought. And like I said, I was a very confused and lost young man at this time. Nothing and no one made any sense to me. The next couple of days were normal. I decided to stay back at home while everyone did their last minute shopping. I reasoned that I'd be more likely to get things I wanted if I wasn't around. On Christmas Eve, we all got together around the tree and exchanged gifts. It was your run-of-the-mill event where I opened my grandparents' packages and pretended that I was overwhelmed by receiving the same socks and sweater I got every year. Now I know I sound ungrateful, but let's be honest, when you're that age, the last thing you wanted was an assortment of underwear. The next morning was what I couldn't wait for. My heart had been set on a bike for the last few years. I'd even shown my parents the exact model I wanted and everything. As my birthday approached, they dropped hint after hint. By the time it arrived, I was hyped beyond belief. My folks had seen the disappointment on my face when I realized that I wasn't getting it. The iPhone, a present any other time I would have been excited about, was going to have to do. I barely slept that night. The second the sun broke through the blinds, I was out of bed and down the stairs, and my folks were already sitting at the table waiting for me to arrive. I turned the corner so fast that I almost missed it. Sitting there, right in the middle of the den, was a brand new mountain bike. Not just any mountain bike either. It was the exact specialized one that I'd been ranting and raving about for the last two years. I was so focused on the bike that I didn't even notice the other boxes under the tree. My mom had to point them out to me. Rather than spend any more time away from my beautiful bike than I needed, I ran over and snatched the boxes and brought them back to the center of the den. I wasn't expecting much else, maybe some clothes or a few games, but to my utter amazement, there was a MacBook along with a set of studio monitors and the others. This was like three Christmases wrapped up in one. I now know my parents had felt bad about not getting the bike on my birthday and decided to spend a little extras this year to make up for it, and I spent the remainder of the day alone enjoying my amazing presence. The weather prevented me from riding too much but I made the best of the time that I did get. When it got too dark to ride, I set up my laptop, got online, and mocked those less fortunate than me late in the morning. I slept in late the next day. It was just afternoon when I came down for breakfast. I grabbed something small and helped my dad carry all the boxes to the curb. It looked like a Best Buy out there. Not only did I get the MacBook and monitors, but my mom also bought dad a 65-inch TV for the den. It was a great Christmas for everyone, at least until the robbery happened. We didn't know it at the time, but those boxes were like the bat signal for criminals. It was a painful learning experience, but one we'd never repeat again. We'd all be tied up and gagged in less than an hour, just because of a pile of trash. It was around two in the afternoon and I was browsing the internet for cool things to pimp out my bike with. All I heard was a bunch of yelling in the kitchen. I came out and was met with a gun in my face. All I saw was the gun and I froze up. The guy yelled at me to move, but I was too scared to. He grabbed me by the arm and shoved me toward the den. Everybody else was already grouped together, waiting to be told what to do next. I'm proud of how calm my dad was. He kept us cool and promised the robbers that we'd do what we were told. They were free to take whatever they wanted. And we wouldn't resist. I guess they weren't going to take the risk, though. 
While one guy held us up at gunpoint, two others bound our hands and blindfolded us with duct tape. When that was done, a voice told me to lie on my stomach. He didn't give me a chance to do it myself. I was pushed and fell forward. The landing knocked the wind out of me for a minute, and the duct tape around my mouth made it hard to regain my breath. A few seconds later I heard the same voice say, Go, and the noise of multiple footsteps shook the floor. I was too terrified to say anything, I just laid there and prayed that it would go fast. The sound of the garage door opening got my attention. That was followed by the noise of what I guess was some large truck. The knocking of the diesel engine was very distinctive, and the next few minutes were just the sound of feet rushing through the house and out to the garage. None of the men spoke, as far as I could tell. Probably no more than ten minutes passed before I heard the door out to the garage close and then complete silence. Maybe a minute went by and my dad asked if everyone was okay. I waited for a voice to tell him to shut up, but it never did. I was confident enough to begin struggling with the tape around my wrist. I twisted and pulled as hard as I could until the tape snapped. Dad was already free in undoing my grandfather's hands when I got the tape off my eyes. And while Dad finished getting everyone loose, I rushed to my room. And my worst fear was realized. Not only were my brand new Mac and speakers gone, but my bike was gone too. And it felt like a knife in my gut. When I returned to the den, Dad was on the phone with 911. I was still in shock, but I remember Mom was especially upset that the robbers had taken Dad's new TV. I knew he'd wanted a big TV like that for a long time. It was like being trapped in some nightmare. All I could do was just sit on the couch and bury my face in my hands until the cops arrived. I kept my mouth shut and let the adults deal with the police. I was in no mood to talk anyway. That sick feeling in my gut stuck with me for the rest of the day and I tossed and turned most of the night. I stayed in my room for the next few days, browsing the internet, trying to get my mind off of the robbery. I still had my old laptop because I'd packed it away under my bed. I guess the thieves were only interested in what they could see. The few times that I did come out of my room I noticed a shell-shocked look on everybody's face. I probably looked the same too, and when it came time to take my grandparents to the airport I just chose to stay home. My parents had lost a lot of expensive things including both of their engagement rings. I didn't dare mention my bike and computer for fear of sounding like some sort of spoiled little brat. And as the weeks went by, a few of the more important things were replaced and we all tried to move ahead with our lives. Updates about the case were few and far between, and this group was obviously professional. Without any names or visual identifications, they all wore masks and gloves, the chances of them getting caught were low. We did learn that they had committed a similar home invasion a few days later across town, it wasn't the objects we lost that made things so terrible. Despite losing a lot of expensive and sentimental objects, it was the feeling of violation that was the worst, at least for me. Everyone in the house became a lot more security focused after that. New, stronger locks and cameras were installed, and I even put a lock on my bedroom and closet door. I took to locking all my valuables in my closet any time I left the house. Most importantly, we never left our boxes out like that ever again. Over a year later, we were shocked to hear that a group with the exact same style of operation had been arrested during another home invasion. All but two of the men admitted to taking part in the robbery of our home. Of course, all of our valuables had been sold long ago and were never to be recovered. The three who had confessed took a plea deal and served a few years in prison. I have no clue what became of them after that. Although the robbery has left us all pretty shaken up, my dad decided that we weren't going to live in fear, and that next Christmas was celebrated just as before. The sting of losing that bike stayed with me for a while, but I'd long given up hope of ever having one like that again. And that's what made my 18th birthday surprise that much more special. Not only was it a mountain bike, but it was the most up-to-date version of the one that I'd lost a few years before. It's seen a lot of miles since then, but it remains the most special gift I've ever received. I moved into the neighborhood a few weeks before the 2015 school year started. The ad I answered gave little more than the basic information about the house, 
a mid-century three-bedroom near the high school. Since I would be working at the school, it sounded perfect. After I took a quick look around, I paid the deposit and the first month's rent. The move didn't take more than a day, I'd say, and my first full day there was a sunny, cool Saturday. And just as I sat down to lunch that afternoon, I heard a knock at my door. It was a bit of a surprise, I really wasn't expecting anyone, and upon opening the door I was greeted by a small group of elderly people. They had bright smiles and some held covered dishes in their hands. I must have seemed unwelcoming, but I was so shocked that I wasn't sure what to say. A moment passed before a very tall, thin man with a deep voice and salt and pepper hair stepped forward and introduced himself. He said his name was Gordon. They were all there to welcome me to the neighborhood. I couldn't think of anything else but to just welcome them in. We all grouped up together in the living room. My guests found their seats where they could and introduced themselves. Meanwhile, those who'd brought food opened the containers and began dishing it out. And that was when I realized that this was a housewarming party. It was like something out of the 1950s. This group of people, many who probably grew up at the time, were welcoming me to the neighborhood with open arms. I was witnessing an aspect of America that I thought had died long ago, if it ever really existed at all, and before I had the opportunity to take in my surroundings, I was sitting in a room full of complete strangers, beer in hand, telling them my life story. It was an experience unlike anything I've ever had, and I loved every minute of it. And that was how it all began for me, and how I met my sort of new family. And from that day forward, I spent as much time as I could spare getting to know everyone. Not everyone was quite as welcoming as the rest. There were a few grumpy old guys who disliked me for whatever reason, but they stayed to themselves for the most part. We agreed to disagree, I guess you could say. And the overwhelming number, however, had been the kindest and most helpful people I'd ever met. Being young and unskilled as I was, especially then, I found myself seeking advice from my older neighbors probably more often than I'd care to admit. Not once was I treated like the clueless little boy that I often viewed myself as. I discovered that despite most of these ladies and gentlemen being white-collar business people and educators, they still knew what it took to maintain a home. And in hindsight, it should have been obvious considering most had lived in these houses a majority of their adult lives and I quickly learned how little college had done to prepare me for my future, and only now had my true education begun. During my time living here, I have grown close to many of these nearby, but one couple in particular are like my second set of parents. I'll refer to them as the Joneses for just sake of anonymity. When Pam and Ed discovered that I was a teacher, they took me under their wing immediately, both of them had only recently retired from the university themselves. The two had met earlier in their careers as professors and would gradually fall in love. Ed and I also shared an obsession for medieval history, an obsession that would often lead to late-night discussions of our personal views on this or that event. Pam was no slouch herself. Her work in mathematics and physics won her several awards, and not to mention that much of the physics textbooks her employer used had been written by her. Enjoying one another's company as we did, we eventually started meeting every Sunday for brunch to enjoy a good meal and to discuss whatever subjects that came to mind. It would be one of these Sundays in which the following story occurred. Somewhere around 10.30 a.m. that morning, I left the house and headed to Pam and Ed's, and along the way, I ran into another neighbor, Tom Valentine. Tom had been a lifelong businessman and an entrepreneur until he sold his final company and retired. We talked about routine gardening and lawn care for 15 or so minutes until I continued my walk. I was maybe 50 yards from Pam and Ed's when I saw a black van back into their driveway and four men get out. I thought they were possibly delivering something until I saw them pull masks over their faces and run toward the door. I wasn't sure what was happening, but it seemed wise to just contact the police regardless. I ran back to Tom's house and let him know what I'd just seen, and he called 911 right away and we waited for the police to arrive. It felt like forever, but it probably wasn't very long. Tom, his wife, and I watched the Jones house as the cops arrived and surrounded it. Officers had just rounded the corner when we started hearing yelling. I braced for some gunfire that I was sure was coming, but fortunately, 
these criminals surrendered without a fight, and one by one, the men were led in handcuffs to police cars. And none of us took a chance to relax yet. We still had no clue if Pam and Ed were okay. Minutes passed, but there was no sign of either one. When an ambulance arrived, I threw caution to the wind and ran down to the house. A few of the other neighbors were starting to show up too. An officer stepped forward and asked us to stay back, and I couldn't stand the wait and I asked if the residents had been hurt, and he didn't answer. I was becoming very agitated now. The lack of information was getting to me, and to my relief, a moment later, Pam stepped out quickly followed by Ed. A couple of officers walked them to the ambulance where a paramedic examined them for injuries. Other than being terrified and a little scuffed up from being locked in the basement, they appeared to be alright. I rushed over to where they were and gave them both a big hug, and more than a few tears were shed also, and I was so very relieved. Once everything was said and done and the authorities went on their way, I insisted Pam and Ed let me take them out. We had a very nice meal and spent the remainder of the day attempting to regain some small bit of normalcy. It's hard to leave that evening, but I could tell that they needed some time to themselves to deal with what had just happened. The Joneses were classy but tough people. I was confident that they'd bounce back, and they did. As usual, we met back up the following Sunday and the robbery was never spoken of. Fortunately, the robbers had all taken pleas and went to prison where they belong, in my opinion. I'm not sure where they are today, but as long as they're nowhere near me or those I love, I'm okay with that. Currently, I'm still living in the same neighborhood. A few of my friends have passed on, but many remain. My Sunday brunches, although not as routine as they once were, still occur when possible. Ed's medical problems have got in the way of him enjoying life like he used to, but I give Pam a helping hand whenever I can. It's painful to see those I love die and suffer, but I really wouldn't live anywhere else. When I was 23, I got a job at a gas station near my apartment. There was a guy about my age who used to always stop in and buy things like beer and papers. He and I would talk about our common interests and we soon discovered that we actually had a lot in common. He eventually asked me out and we began seeing each other outside of my work. It wasn't anything serious until his roommate moved out. At this point he invited me to move in and I accepted. And now that we shared the same place, the relationship grew into something more. Even though I had my own bedroom, I slept in his bed with him most nights, and my room wasn't much more than a big closet for my clothes after that. After six months passed and our third roommate left, we chose not to look for someone else to replace him. And this did present something of a problem, though. Without his income, we'd have to figure out another way to pay the bills. Mark, which is what we'll call my boyfriend, took a second job delivering pizzas. He was exhausted all the time and hated the work, but he stayed anyway. And then one night, we were drinking with some friends, and one of them offered to front us with some products. We agreed, and that was how we began dealing. I wasn't new to the world of illicit chemicals, but I'd never sold any before. And we started with weed, and things went very well. We only dealt with friends and kept a very low profile. As long as our bills were getting paid, and we had food in the pantry, we were great. The bad times started when we got greedy. Here and there, people asked for stronger stuff and we resisted as long as we could. In hindsight, it was the worst decision we could have ever made, but we wanted to get a house of our own and this sounded like the quickest way to get it. We were put in contact with another group who were willing to supply us with anything we wanted. This one decision would destroy our lives. We didn't realize just how different the customer base was going to be. Mark and I had taken our own share of the hard stuff, but we had always gotten it from friends. Our crowd was pretty chill compared to a lot of the other clientele that we were now serving. I was used to the laid-back people, the kind of people who hang around for a few hours and smoke with you. I met some interesting individuals in the early days, but these new people were a drastic contrast. The rule had always been to have customers hang out for a while to prevent drawing attention. We had to abandon this practice pretty quickly after the upgrade. 
We were dealing with full-blown addicts now, and they wanted nothing more than to score and get their fix. At first, I felt sorry for them, but as time passed, my attitude shifted to one of disgust. Most of these people would gladly sell their own children if given the opportunity. I know it sounds cruel, but in that short period of time, I saw some truly disgusting things. Had I known what was coming, I would have been afraid instead. I had yet to meet the worst of what mankind had to offer. We'd been selling weed to a young guy named Sean on and off for the last year. He wasn't a particularly talkative guy, but he'd always seemed cool enough. When we expanded the operation, he started coming around a lot more often and asking questions. Looking back, I should have known something was up, but I didn't. Late one Saturday night, he called Mark and asked if he could come by and pick up an ounce for him and a friend. Mark had the flu and I tried to get him to say no, but he assured me that it would just be a quick pickup. He promised that he'd go back to bed after, so I reluctantly agreed. About a half an hour later, Sean showed up, got his stuff, and left. He did seem kind of nervous, but neither Mark nor I paid any mind. He was in and out within a few minutes, and Mark was in the kitchen when a knock came at the door. We weren't expecting anyone, but I went to the door just to check. I looked through the peephole and saw Sean. I assumed that he'd forgotten something and opened the door. I hadn't gotten the first word out before he rushed me and pushed me to the ground. A second man ran in right behind him. I couldn't do anything but yell out to Mark. I'm not sure what happened after I fell, but the sound of gunfire filled the apartment almost immediately. All I could see from my position was the second man holding a pistol and firing in the direction of the kitchen. I stumbled back to my feet and ran out of the apartment. The gunfire was still going on when I left and my ears were ringing. We had a neighbor a few units over that we hung out with sometimes. I ran to his place and pounded on the door, and it seemed like forever until he opened it. He saw me and immediately pulled me in. I guess he heard what was happening because he was on the phone with 911 when I got there. He told me the cops were on their way and I ran back to the apartment to see if Mark was okay. The door was still wide open when I got there. I was terrified Sean and his friends were still there but I called out to Mark anyway and he didn't answer and a sick feeling churned in the pit of my stomach. I carefully and slowly walked into the apartment calling for Mark as I went. When I turned the corner into the kitchen, I saw him lying against one of the cabinets. He was bleeding badly and I couldn't tell if he was alive. The pistol was still gripped tightly in his hand and all of a sudden, I remembered the product. I needed to get rid of it before the cops showed up. I ran to our hiding place and found it empty. Sean had more than likely planned this a long time ago and chosen that night to act. I was actually relieved it was gone to be honest. The garbage had been a source of friction and misery in our lives for a long time, and it was their problem now. A nightmare of a life I wouldn't wish on my own worst enemy, and I walked back into the kitchen and sat down next to Mark's body on the floor, and despite all of their hard work, the paramedics couldn't bring him back. I laid him to rest a few days later and have tried to carry on alone ever since. Sean would get his punishment, just not in the way I had expected. I was never able to identify the second man. The police looked for Sean for a few months until he popped up after being killed attempting to rob yet another dealer. I wish I could say that it was a satisfying end, but I was just sick of all the killing. When I got myself into all of this, I didn't see any problem with peddling a little weed to a few friends. It wasn't crack after all. But before I knew it, I was a full-fledged pusher, no better than a common street thug and I more than likely assisted in someone's death at least once. I was exploiting people and destroying lives just to make a buck. Seven years on, I still can't help but feel that I had it coming. The pursuit of a quick and easy way to get ahead cost me the man that I loved and left me walking through the next few years confused and riddled with guilt. I don't know if there's a moral to the story. Maybe we could all just treat each other better and try to get along. Is it really that hard. The story I'm about to tell happened to me when I was 23. At the time I was living in the Midwest and working as a paralegal. 
My hometown was halfway across the country and I didn't go back home very often to see my family. My first year away I decided to spend Thanksgiving alone. Flying back and forth two months in a row didn't make financial sense. A week or so prior to the holidays I happened to mention this to my boss, and upon hearing this he made me an offer that I really couldn't resist. It just so happened that my family was going out of town for the holiday and they needed someone to house sit while they were gone. He preferred me over a stranger. All I really had to do was make sure that the pets had food and water and let them out on occasion. And best of all, I'd be getting paid double my usual wage. Needless to say, I accepted immediately. Two days before Thanksgiving, I arrived at the house and got the key and a few last-minute instructions. The family left for the airport soon after, and I was left alone with Patches the cat and Oscar the dachshund in this big, beautiful house. My first night there was quiet and uneventful. I ordered a pizza for dinner and hit the hay just after 10 p.m. I would be awakened the next morning at about 7 by Oscar. I let him out to do his thing and fired up the coffee pot. While I waited for my breakfast burritos to heat up, I let Oscar back in and poured myself a cup of coffee. Oscar stared at me intensely as I enjoyed my meal and watched the morning news. After breakfast, I got an urge to take Oscar on a walk around the neighborhood. I heard that there was a nature park nearby and I was curious to check it out. I assumed Oscar would love all the new scents, too. We walked around there for about an hour and then headed home to start working on dinner. Just because I was spending the holiday alone didn't mean that I wasn't going to stuff myself. I put my pre-cooked chicken in the oven to reheat and began working on the sides. Maybe an hour passed before I began hearing a rattling at the front door. I was going to ignore it, but Oscar started growling. I turned off the stovetop and followed the noise. Oscar ran ahead of me and soon began barking. He seemed pretty worked up, and I stopped at the edge of the hallway and peeked around the corner at the door. From where I stood, I could see a human-like form through the glass of the door. It looked like they were trying to get the door open. Oscar was losing his mind now, and I was frozen stiff. I had no idea what to do until the door cracked open. Oscar was fighting to get at the person through the narrow space in the door, and the person was kicking at him. I knew if I was going to do something, I had to do it now. So I ran back to the kitchen where my phone was sitting and dialed 911. I could still hear the man yelling at Oscar at the door. That little guy was fighting his heart out, God bless him. The operator had just told me that the cops were on their way when I looked up and came eye to eye with a very tall and skinny man. I don't think that he was expecting me to be there. His eyes went wide open, as was his mouth, and fear overtook me and I started to scream at him to get out. It wasn't long before he turned tail and ran back out the door. Oscar started barking at him again as he ran away. The cops showed up a minute later and I gave them a description of the man. One of them suggested staying somewhere else for the night, but I couldn't leave Oscar all by himself after he fought so hard. Patches showed up around dusk and joined Oscar and me where we were curled up on the couch and watched movies until sunrise on Thanksgiving morning. I was able to eventually doze off for a few hours and got up at about noon to call my boss and let him know what had happened. He was understandably upset and decided that he'd cut the vacation short so they could get back and deal with the legal stuff. The family arrived back in the early hours the next morning and I got home and into my bed at about dawn. A few days later, we were all back at work when I learned a very interesting piece of information. My boss had spent much of his remaining time off speaking with the officers who had been assigned to the case. They had all put the available evidence together and were almost positive who the home invader had been. His name was Brent, and he had worked for the family for several years until my boss was forced to let him go because of his drug problem. Brent was aware that the family went out of town every year, but it was the physical description that ultimately convinced them of his guilt. It didn't take long for the police to catch up with him, and he took a deal for a decreased sentence. He was back home with his family by the next Christmas. I'm not mad that he got off so lightly. After all, he wasn't violent. It was his drug addiction that had driven him to make such a stupid decision and I just hope that he's gotten the help now that he needed and isn't suffering as he was. I've since married and moved on to another job in a new city. 
I've wised up and probably wouldn't suggest any young woman to do something like that by herself, especially with the way things are now. Had I do it all over again, I would have just spent the money and flown back home to be with my family. And in hindsight, the money didn't make up for not being able to be there with my parents on such an important day. This story takes place in the mid-1980s when my mom was a teenager in high school. My mother and my aunt grew up on a farm in central Florida, which was relatively in the middle of nowhere at the time. We still live in this area, and it's more urbanized now, but at that point in time, it was mostly woods and farmland. My great aunt, uncle, and our cousins lived on the same property in another house, so they weren't entirely alone. However, outside that, you'd have to drive a mile, or maybe a little less than that, before you reach their next neighbor. My grandfather coached for the local high school football team, and my mother and aunt were cheerleaders, so on Fridays, he would have to coach at the school's game, and my mom and aunt would be there to cheerlead. The rest of the family would usually come along as well, since my cousins went to that school too, and there wasn't really anything else to do in that small town on a Friday night. They would usually get to the game earlier than everyone else, considering that he was a coach. One particular Friday, however, my mother started feeling very sick throughout the day, and by the time the evening rolled around, she felt horrible. She informed my grandfather that she wasn't feeling up to going and that she would be staying home to rest. My grandma made her something to eat for dinner, and after that, the whole family, including my great-aunt and great-uncle, went on their way. She was alone on the property. Now for context, we eventually sold this property when I was a young child, so I don't have many memories of my grandparents' property. One thing I can remember was that it could get very creepy at night, even with other people there, so being alone on it at night must have been a lot more frightening. Anyways, my mom went to lay down right after they left, but long after that, maybe 5 or 10 minutes, she realized that she needed to call her cheerleading coach at the school to let her know that she wasn't going to be there tonight so that she could be prepared for her absence. Keep in mind, this is the mid-80s, so there were no cell phones. My mom had to get up and walk all the way to the kitchen to use the phone. As she was walking through the house, she started to feel a bit creeped out, that classic feeling of something not being quite right, that instinctual feeling we get when something is telling us that we're probably in a bad situation and may not even know it yet. Outside, it was getting dark out, and there were not many lights on inside the house which contributed to this uneasy feeling. Now, a very important detail, the phone in my grandparents' house has a longer cord than most phones at the time. She said that you could walk into other rooms and the cord was long enough that the phone could be brought out of the kitchen into the neighboring rooms, which were the living room, the hallway, and my grandparents' bedroom. In the hallway by the kitchen and by my grandparents' bedroom, my grandfather kept a shotgun on the wall, fully loaded and ready to go. Not the safest thing, I guess, but when you live alone in the woods, I guess you want to be ready to defend yourself the second you know you're in trouble. He had always told my mom and aunt, do not touch that shotgun unless your life is in danger. She took this very seriously, and had never even thought about touching the gun. By this point, she was in the kitchen. She dialed the number to call her coach and informed her about her illness. I believe they continued talking for a minute or so because she says that the coach was still on the phone when my mom heard strange noises coming from my grandparents' room. My mother, very frightened, told the coach that she heard something and grabbed the shotgun off the wall, the phone still pressed to her ear. She wasn't sure if she was overreacting and had imagined something, but she opened the door to my grandparents' room, and what she saw made her drop the phone right on the floor in shock. The window was completely open, and there was a large man with one leg over the window sill and one leg still outside. What was so awkward about this was that he had basically stopped in the middle of coming in when he realized that he had been caught by her, as if he was not expecting someone to be home, or that he simply did not expect her to have heard him coming in. They just stared at each other for another good five seconds, him just halfway in the room and her just standing there in the doorway, phone on the floor with my mom's coach still in the line asking if she was okay, shotgun in hand, staring at each other, both almost unsure what to do. My mom, terribly frightened, finally mustered up the will to speak first. 
In a very shy and afraid voice, she managed to say, I, I have a gun. T turn around or I'll, I'll leave and I'll, or I'll shoot. The man just stood there. She said it was as if though he was wondering whether she was bluffing or not. Finally, after what seemed like hours of just staring, he suddenly swung his other leg in very fast and turned quickly like he was about to charge her. My mother, terrified with her hand shaking, fired the shotgun and hit him in the shoulder. The impact was so strong that it knocked her back on the floor and sent the man directly out the window that he had come in. Blood was everywhere around the window, and she picked the phone back up, now sobbing, telling her coach to call the police to her house. When she looked back, she saw the man running, clutching his shoulder, bleeding all over their yard, running back to the woods behind their property. Keep in mind that he had just been shot in the shoulder with a shotgun. It's not like it was a handgun or something. This dude had basically just immediately gotten up like it was nothing and started hauling it off into the woods. I don't know the exact order of what happened next, but the police eventually did get there. My grandparents hurried home sometime shortly after, and the police were still there. I think the most weird part about this story is that there was a trail of blood that the guy had left as he was fleeing the property, which went out into the woods. The police investigated and found that it continued for some distance into the forest and eventually stopped. There was no body or anything, like the blood just stopped, and they never caught up with the guy. I think it's bizarre because she had shot him in the upper torso with a shotgun, and around the window in the room looked like the scene of a horror movie. There was so much blood. How he got away apparently alive and so quickly without the cops catching up to him is very odd. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Time, and super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit r slash let's read official or send it over email and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't leave your noodles in your pockets.